there and welcome once again to The Context. I'm John Barron. Coming up, are we seeing the return of the Cold War or something different and potentially more deadly? But first, to a danger lurking much closer to home, Australia's addiction to poker machines. It's long been said we are a nation of gamblers. We'll bet on two flies crawling up a wall. We commemorate Australia's war dead on Anzac Day by flipping two pennies and punting on the result. The race that stops the nation, the Melbourne Cup, has always been about having a flutter with a bookie or getting into the office sweep. Oh yes, I'll be in the sweeps anyway. I don't know that I'll be backing anything straight out. Do you think that people are still as interested in the Melbourne Cup as they used to be? Oh yes, when it comes around on the Tuesday. Excuse me, can you hear me? Yes. What's your tip for the Melbourne Cup? I wouldn't know. How are you going to pick the winner of the Cup? <laughs> By sticking a pin in the paper. Increasingly, Australians are wagering on sports like football and cricket. Apps on smartphones have put a betting shop in every pocket. Government lotteries have been an important source of revenue for decades. The $102 million price tag of the Sydney Opera House was largely paid for by a state lottery. And then there are the pokies. We've always known they take our money. Why else did we call them the one-armed bandits? The first legal poker machines appeared in New South Wales clubs in 1956. It was seen as a way for not-for-profit venues, including RSLs and leagues clubs, to pay for services without charging large membership fees. A decade later, they were rolling in the cash and while there were growing concerns about what were then called compulsive gamblers, most agreed it was an acceptable form of entertainment and they liked the odds. This typical Sydney RSL club returns about 95% to the player. Harbour Diggers Club has 70 machines and 5,000 members. This year it announced a record profit from poker machines of over half a million dollars. Oh, lovely, you beaut. <laughs> that looks nice, doesn't it? Why do you play the machines? Oh, it's just a little outlet. Do you invest much? Oh. Round about three to five pounds. To put that in context, at the time, five pounds would have been about 10% of a married couple's weekly earnings, or $350 per week today. It turns out, though, Australians aren't exactly a nation of gamblers. Here's Madeline Morris with By the Numbers. Researchers have found over one-third of adult Australians gamble at least once a month. But most of those people are entering lotteries. Just 7% play the pokies on a regular basis, coming a distant second ahead of the scratchies, horse and dog racing and other sports betting. Men are significantly more likely to gamble in any given month than women, and a higher proportion of people over 55 gambles than any other age group. We lose around $25 billion a year on all forms of legal gambling, with half of that being lost on pokies alone. And close to $4 billion ends up in the pocket of government through gaming taxes. Surveys of Australian gambling expenditure, in other words, losses, show on a per capita basis, losses went down from over $900 at the start of the 21st century to around $650. But that includes a lot of people who don't lose anything because they don't gamble at all. People who actually play the pokies lose on average $157.10 per month, or almost $1,900 a year. But even that doesn't tell the full story. It's been estimated that 9% of men and 5% of women are at risk of gambling-related problems and that 1.5% of men and 0.6% of women are considered problem gamblers. Other studies have found that small group, 1% of the population, is responsible for 42% of gambling losses. Most countries restrict pokies to casinos. While that's true for Western Australia, the rest of Australia has more than three quarters of the world's gaming machines in pubs, clubs and other venues and 18% of all the machines in the world. And I have one final number that helps explain all of the others. 200,000. 
That's the estimated number of poker machines in Australia today. Here at The Context, we've spoken to some of Australia's top experts on poker machine gambling and addiction to find out how pokies work, how they hook players and what can be done to minimise the harm they can do. Sally Gainsbury is Professor in the School of Psychology at the University of Sydney and Director of the Gambling Treatment Research Centre. Dr Charles Livingston is Associate Professor in the School of Public Health at Monash University. He specialises in the link between addiction and other health issues. And Dr Christopher Hunt. He's been working with problem gamblers for the last 15 years and is Chief Supervisor of the Gamble Aware Clinics. My first question was whether there is something particularly addictive about poker machines compared to other forms of gambling. Well, the, the reason that these things are addictive is because they stimulate uh, the reward centre in the brain and they, re they stimulate that by providing lots of what we call reinforcement. So that is mini rewards or uh, anticipation of rewards uh, and they do it on an irregular schedule. So essentially when you use a poker machine, you are using it very quickly. They operate very rapidly, often as little as two seconds between spins. Uh, each spin provides anticipation, which is itself a reinforcement. Uh, if you get a little win, that is itself a major reinforcement. If you get what's called a loss disguised as a win, where you win a little bit but not as much as you bet, then that is also a reinforcement. You never know when you're going to win. Every time you place a bet, there's a rush of adrenaline. There's the dopamine releasing when you do have a win. And interestingly enough, when people don't have a win, they're also known to have elevated arousal because that, that loss is actually signalling the win might be around the corner. And it seems that many poker machine gamblers simply misunderstand their chances of winning. When they hear a machine has to return between 85 and 90% of the money that goes in, they incorrectly assume they will get 85 to 90% of their money back, maybe more. What it means in practice is any time that percentage is less than 100%, what that means is the longer you sit in front of a poker machine, the more you're guaranteed to lose. So if that number is less than 100%, Successive play just means eventually you're going to go bankrupt. I think that's a really important issue. When people think they're going to get 85% return, what they don't realise is that that means every time they push the button, they lose 15%. So that's why people often say to me, I go to the pokers and they say they give you 85% back, but I always leave with nothing. And I say, that's because every spin on average, you might get 85% back, but 15% uh, of that, has been spent. So you were losing 15% every spin. The best way to think of it is that for a machine which has an 85% return to player, the price of paying that machine is 15% of your stake every time you push the button. So do our experts think that some people are more likely to become addicted to pokies than others? People that are uh, suffering, for example, from PTSD uh, or have had a very traumatic event in their past or who grew up in a household where there was discord, or who may have had a parent or a sibling who was a gambler uh, and who experienced that firsthand and experienced the consequence of it, uh, or had a parent who was an alcoholic or drank too much, uh, they seem to be predisposed more towards this type of addiction than other people. You know, many women in middle life um, have, have told us that they find the pokies very attractive because it's safe to be there. Uh, they can get in late at night if they need to find somewhere to be uh, and they're not questioned as to their motive in being there. We do see there are some characteristics that are more common, so impulsivity for one. Um, people from lower socioeconomic status tend to um, be drawn to gambling a little bit more. Um, but generally speaking, there's not a clear picture of... Um, you know, this is what a, a gambler looks like and someone else who doesn't gamble looks different. It's, it's you know, we see it, people from all walks of life. And what are the most effective treatments and harm minimisation measures? Having something that encourages people to take a break in play is a really helpful mechanism to get people to think for themselves. Ultimately what we need, because poker machines have this continuous reinforcing gambling, is for people to stop check in with themselves and then think, do I really want to continue to play? Can I afford to continue to play? If we can start to engineer our venues, engineer the machines to have breaks in play, to encourage people to stop and to check in with themselves, that self-awareness and self-appraisal is ultimately 
going to be? What helps people make an appropriate decision for themselves? So there is a lots of misconceptions about how poker machines work in the wider community. Um, beliefs about what that payback percentage means, beliefs about you know when a machine is going to pay. There's so many misconceptions out there. If people understood a little bit more about how these machines work, it would help a lot with reducing their pool to the general community. And also in terms of the promotion of advertising. So, um, you know, these big flashing signs about leg jackpots, there's a, you know, a $10,000 prize about to go off or, you know, these big flashing noises that come off whenever a jackpot goes off, that's sort of drawing attention to the big wins while sort of minimizing attention to the losses that plays into sort of the, the picture, that sort of focus on the wins whilst ignoring the losses that are slowly, slowly, slowly adding up. Anything that's really going to sort of counterbalance um, that bias is really going to help. Any strategy such as a, a smoking ban or removing ATMs or even forced shutdowns or breaks within gaming machines are going to be helpful in terms of encouraging that informed choice so that the person is making the decision to continue to gamble or take a break. This week, the New South Wales clubs industry unveiled a draft gaming code of practice, including an involuntary ban on people identified as problem gamblers. I asked our experts if they could do one thing to minimise the social and economic damage being done by poker machines, what would it be? One of the potentially most useful initiatives that is on the horizon is cashless gambling. The use of cash means it's very difficult for people to track how much money they're spending gambling and they can put more and more money in without really thinking about it too much. If we move to a system of removing cash from gambling machines, of requiring people to sign up to an identified account, they can then track how much money they're spending, they can set limits that are binding, and they be notified when they reach their limits. This might be useful towards increasing people's awareness of how much they're spending and combined with things like limits and activity statements could be an effective way to start to shift away from the excessive problems associated with electronic gaming machines. For me personally, if I had to choose one thing to help with, uh, you know, problem gambling on poker machines in this country, it'd probably be to limit jackpots. Uh, when there's big jackpots, it tends to draw a lot of people in and it makes people persist despite losses because if the jackpot's $10,000, say, and someone's down three, $400, they might think, well, if I keep going, but if that jackpot comes, you know, it's going to solve all my problems. So having smaller jackpots um, is going to limit those losses because people are going to feel that less of a compulsion to keep going when they are losing large sums of money. I think what I would introduce would be a universal pre-commitment scheme which enabled people to uh, decide on a limit for their own gambling, both of time and money, uh, and to uh, register to do that and then to be able to change that so that they could decrease the amount of money or time they spent but not increase it except at irregular intervals. Time for Now and Then. And should poker machines be abolished altogether? The ABC first posed that question to ordinary Australians in 1961, just five years after they were first introduced. We thought it was worth re-asking that question today. Here's Ange Lavoie-Pierre. We're discussing poker machines on the street. Now, do you think that poker machines should be abolished? My oath, I do. Oh, why? Yeah. Well, they're not bad dinkum. <laughs> oh, you think they're loaded against the player? Yes, my word, they are. I think people are very weak and therefore they must be protected. Most decidedly. Why do you say that? Well, because there's too many married men doing all their wages on them. I've been in a couple of clubs and I've played the poker machine. They're loaded against them. I hear too many wives complaining that their wages don't get brought home to them. How much did you lose altogether? Oh, about 80 quid. <laughs> so how do we feel about the pokies now? We're going to ask some very important people, the Australian public. Excuse me, can I ask you a quick question for the ABC? Sorry, I'm going to get back to my partner. Hi, can I ask you a quick question for the ABC? Sorry. Okay. I will chase you. I'm very, I'm very fast. Maybe I'll, start, maybe I'll go straight in. I'll do like a hi, quick question for the ABC. Do you think that pokies should be abolished? Pokies. Uh, oh, hold on a second. Oh, I haven't even dressed. You look great. <laughs> you look great. Do you think pokies should be abolished? Absolutely. 
It's emphatic. Yes. Yeah. The, um, pokies, the, there's no place in society for pokies. They just take money away from people. They're addictive. It's tawdry, mm. you know, and it's old fashioned. The odds are terrible. Even the people that make them say you shouldn't play them because you can't win. Yeah, they're detrimental for the psychological and emotional well being of people and families. That is a very comprehensive answer. Thank you. Oh, lovely. You beaut. <laughs> How much do you invest a week? About four dollars. Do you think it's six. spent wisely? Oh no, a bit foolishly. But uh, when you know when to stop, well that's it. But how do you know when to stop? When the four dollars is gone. Do you think that poker machines should be abolished? No fear. No way. Of course they're first class, huh? What does it matter? It doesn't make any difference much. You don't blame the machine, you blame the mud for plays them. Do you play the machines at all? <laughs> oh, yes, I do. Successfully? Uh, occasionally. As long as they're not fixed. You gamble on other things? No, I do not. My husband doesn't gamble. He says he'd rather drink his than put it in a poker machine. What about other kinds of gambling? Are there kinds of gambling that are okay? That's an interesting question. Yeah, I guess that's where it gets complicated. Do you gamble at all? Nah, no good at it. I'll have a bet on Melbourne Cup and stuff. I'm not a very risky guy. Um, I play it safe, play it cool. Um, <laughs> I like a bit of Keno, but yeah, not really the pokies. But um, yeah, yeah. So I'm a hypocrite, but yeah. We all are. It's yeah. okay. <laughs> you can't stop gambling. You'll never stop it. We all do it. You took a chance by asking me. I did. That's gambling. You know. And if you didn't gamble on one thing, you gamble on something else, wouldn't you? And if you or a family member are dealing with gambling addiction, you can contact the National Gambling Helpline on 1800 858 858. Coming up, is the world slipping back into a Cold War, bringing with it the spectre of the previously unthinkable, a nuclear exchange? Or is this another kind of military and strategic contest carrying different risks? We'll speak to somebody who spent decades on the front line of the Cold War planning NATO defences. But first, to some historical context. In the final days of World War II, German dictator Adolf Hitler was convinced when Soviet Russian forces invading from the east encountered American-led forces invading from the west, the uneasy allies would turn on each other, giving Germany a way out. Hitler was wrong, but the end of the war did see a standoff emerge between capitalist liberal democracies and the emerging communist Eastern Bloc. Winston Churchill famously described it this way. From Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. And that Cold War continued for almost half a century. And now, three decades after the fall of communism in Europe, relations with Russia are back in the deep freeze. It's Christmas Day 1991 and in homes across America, reruns of It's a Wonderful Life are interrupted by the president, George Bush. George! George, Mary. For over 40 years, the United States led the West in the struggle against communism and the threat it posed to our most precious values. This struggle shaped the lives of all Americans. It forced all nations to live under the specter of nuclear destruction. That confrontation is now over. Bush declared victory in the long-running Cold War against the Soviet Union. We stand tonight before a new world of hope and possibilities for our children. A world we could not have contemplated a few years ago. By New Year's Eve, the Soviet Union had dissolved into 15 republics. Russia inherited the USSR's place on the UN Security Council under its new president, Boris Yeltsin. The Soviet economy had been crumbling for decades, but as Yeltsin administered shock therapy on the massive public workforce and sold off government-owned industries, a few oligarchs became instant billionaires, but most citizens suffered. Freedom came at a high cost. Yeltsin's popularity in Russia sank while it soared overseas. Well, now for the first time I can tell you that you're a disaster. 
Jokes aside, Yeltsin and US President Bill Clinton continued the very serious process of arms reduction, shipping out thousands of nuclear weapons from former Soviet republics, including Ukraine and Belarus. Boris Yeltsin was unpredictable, unconventional, often not entirely sober, but ultimately unthreatening. There were still tensions. Russia grew increasingly concerned about the expansion of NATO towards its western borders and opposed NATO's intervention in Kosovo in the former Yugoslavia. For its part, the US and the West decried Russia's war in Chechnya, but all in all, the 1990s seemed like a page in history had turned. Liberal democracies had prevailed in the great ideological battles of the 20th century. It was on New Year's Eve, December 31, 1999, when suddenly another page was turned. Обязанности президента России на председателя правительства Владимира Владимировича Путина. Vladimir Putin was a former KGB officer and head of the Federal Security Service. As Prime Minister, Putin projected strength when bombers began targeting Russian cities. Putin blamed the Chechens while the evidence was sketchy. Some believed it was the work of Russian intelligence services. Still, it was enough to convince the ailing Yeltsin to make Putin acting president and, the following March, Putin won the presidency in his own right, and apart from a four-year period when he notionally served as Prime Minister before amending the Constitution, Putin has stayed Russian president, rebuilding the economy while curtailing democracy, human rights and press freedom, wielding increasingly authoritarian power. Putin also warned of a wider crackdown on dissent. In the meantime, relations with the United States soured after Russian military interventions in Chechnya, Georgia and Syria, tampering in the 2016 US election to help elect an erratic and unusually pro-Russian American president. Donald Trump is gushing again over Vladimir Putin. If he says great things about me, I'm going to say great things about him. And now an invasion of neighbouring Ukraine, which has once again raised the spectre of nuclear conflict and a new Cold War. For more, we're joined by Jim Townsend. He held many senior US Defence Department roles during and after the Cold War, including Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defence, and he's also the former Director of Defence Planning for the US mission to NATO. Jim Townsend, welcome to The Context. It's great to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. We are all about the context here, Jim. So can you put the current state of relations between Russia and the West into context for us? Because some are comparing it to the Cold War. How do you see it? This is different. Uh, it has a lot of the horror, of course, that we saw in World War I and in World War II. Uh, you know, the Cold War was not a hot war, obviously. Uh, so I think what we're seeing are scenes that would have been familiar to uh, those who, uh, who experienced World War I. There, there isn't anyone around now that was there, but the artillery, the bombardments, uh, the, uh, the horrible experience of troops in trenches, uh, we're seeing that, uh, and we're seeing war crimes too that we might have seen in 1945 in Berlin, as Soviet troops went into Berlin. Uh, you know, where it's just it's a different experience than the than the Cold War in a, in a lot of different ways. There is the threat of escalation to nuclear war, at least the use of battlefield nuclear weapons by Russia. So, what are the implications of that? Well, you're absolutely right. Uh, this is the first time uh, in the post-Cold uh, War uh, time uh, uh, where a nuclear card has actually been laid on the table. Uh, you know, he, uh, Putin and his people were pretty upfront about that early on, uh, saying, uh, and we've known too that in Russian doctrine, the use of, uh, of a battlefield nuclear weapon uh, was, was foreseen. Uh, it was something that was in their doctrine. Under certain circumstances, they would use it. Uh, and I think in this case with Putin, uh, he wanted to make sure that the West understood that. Uh, and it was understood publicly that this was something that, was, uh, that, uh, that could happen. Uh, it was meant more as a scare tactic, I think, uh, at the very beginning. You know, I think Putin came into this uh, situation in Ukraine feeling that the West was not unified, uh, 
that Europe particularly was fragmented. Europe could be uh, scared, uh, could be frightened into, uh, uh, into uh, not doing anything about uh, Russia going into Ukraine the way they did. Um, and I think too, I think he misunderstood the United States and felt that playing a nuclear card could weaken uh, the Biden administration's support for Ukraine. And uh, he was wrong. Jim, we are seeing lots of claims and denials that Putin is sick, maybe on death's door. Uh, will US officials know one way or the other? And what would be their contingency planning now? Well, I think, you know, there's always speculation about the state of, of uh, health of various leaders. I remember uh, so many, uh, uh, Donald Trump, there were all kinds of theories and uh, rumors about his state of health and Putin as well and others. I think um, we don't know, but I think uh, certainly uh, he looks hale and hearty uh, and he looks like he's determined to carry through with his plans. I think that uh, most people, when they look out ahead, uh, they, the replacement for Putin very well could be another Putin-esque person, maybe even worse. Uh, I don't think that there's necessarily a feeling that suddenly if Putin were to leave the scene that Russia would become uh, rushing into the arms of Western Europe and saying, we've come home, uh, we're going to be just like you. Uh, I, I don't think that's in the cards. You know, back when the Cold War ended and, um, and we saw the Soviet Union give way to Russia, uh, I was in the Pentagon then and, and all of us were so hopeful, uh, full of exuberance about uh, the end of the Cold War, peace coming to Europe, a Europe whole free and at peace, you know, that was the mantra. Even though Russia was struggling to gain its feet economically, uh, Yeltsin, Boris Yeltsin was the president then, we really felt uh, perhaps uh, uh, overconfident and, and uh, over exuberant uh, that, that we we're on the right trajectory. And in fact, uh, it just didn't take hold in Russia. Uh, and so uh, I, think, I think this time around, uh, as we look at what could be uh, Russia post-Putin, I, I think we have to avoid being too exuberant and, and understand that Russia, uh, they don't, that Russian governments in the past centuries don't necessarily um, immediately flip and, and become Europe-like. And Jim Townsend, if the future is uncertain with regards to Russia and Putin, I guess it's also fair to say it's uncertain from NATO's point of view with the United States and the possible return of Donald Trump. What security risks do you see that possibility posing? Well, that's a great point. And I think it shows you that in, in a democracy, elections matter. <laughs> uh, not that uh, Russia is a democracy, but, uh, but certainly your point about Trump or anyone else in the West, you know, elections matter. Uh, Boris Johnson has left the scene. We'll see what happens there. So um, we'll have to see what happens in both our midterm elections as well as with the president uh, in two years. And certainly allies, including Australia, you know, the, uh, and, and uh, their allies and friends are going to be looking carefully uh, fingers crossed uh, that uh, the U.S. doesn't uh, head off on another adventure such as we had with Donald Trump, that we can be more predictable. We'll have a president come on the scene, uh, whether it's Joe Biden or whoever it is, that will be a continuation of, of, a, um, of, a, of an administration that the nations have gotten used to seeing, a, 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 an administration that's cooperative, that works in alliances, that works in coalitions, that are that uh, and a, and a, and a, a president that uh, has an understanding uh, for foreign policy and, and is a good neighbor. Uh, I, I think we all hope for that, uh, but uh, we'll have to see what happens in the next couple of years. Jim Townsend, thanks for being with us on The Context. You're very, very welcome. Anytime. And that's all for another edition of The Context. Next time, modern marriage and divorce, Australian style. We'll see you then.